but I want to say first at the outset, I want to acknowledge that the Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples, and the university resides on land ceded in the 1890 Treaty of Saginaw. And so um, this program comes from uh, a place shared by the places that our uh, panelists are in right now. And um, to, I also want to say that this program was supported by the Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. So thank you for their support and the traditional Michigan traditional arts program um, at MSU. So thank you to both those sponsors for allowing us to have this space in technology in the virtual world. And even with all of its glitches, I think it's better than not having connections. So um, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's got its downsides, but it's got its good sides as well. So I think uh, Denise has already said that the this program will be recorded and we hope to then put it up on the Michigan State University Museum uh, site so that um, other people can learn from the conversations that we will be having tonight. I also want to say that I um, have not had the pleasure of meeting all of you. I've met some of you briefly in person at the opening of the exhibition Kindred, uh, the um, traditional arts of the little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa. And then I've had some little email communications, which I'm grateful for having with you all. So um, in this virtual space, we'll get to know each other a little bit more. And I look forward to uh, long-term uh, interactions with you all. Um, so to let everybody else know, uh, this is going to be a conversation with a group of individuals who are all related to each other. And in a moment, I will uh, let each person on the screen introduce themselves, uh, their name and, um, and uh, their relationship to the rest of the group. And, and maybe just a like a one or two line um, note about their occupation or their affiliation with the Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa. And then um, we did have a little chat before this virtual conversation uh, by email about some questions. And so I've heard from most of you all and I will spit back to you some of the questions that you you um, answered in email form and now you can do it verbally. And then hopefully we'll have some more conversation and other questions will emerge. We'll do that for about an hour um, or 40 minutes, however we feel it's going. And then we'll open it up for the Q and A from those people who are participating in this conversation um, virtually uh, as viewers. So, um, first. yeah, so, so I'm gonna start with the oldest. Okay, whoever wants to go first. Hello. We'll start, start at the top, work our way down. Oh, okay. well, wait, what top? Are, you're okay. at the bottom of my screen, but that's oh. okay. But in, he's the oldest. I, all right, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that I'm from a family where I'm the oldest of five. So however you guys sort it out. <laughs> okay. Well, I being the eldest have been selected to be first. My name is Vicki Lynn. Um, I'm the eldest sister. Uh, and uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the next sister. I am Regina Brubaker Carver. And I like to think of myself as the memory keeper of the family. And then. All right. My name is Stella Kay. I am the youngest sister that they constantly remind me of. Um, and I am the vice chair of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. 
Um, I mean, I think I'm next. Um, so I'm gonna do a whole thing and introduce myself in the language today. Um, so Ani, Becca, and Dishnikaz, Magizi, and Dodum, Baraski, and Dondraba, Waganaxi, Odao, and Dao. My name is Becca. I'm Eagle Clan. I'm from Petoskey, Michigan, and a member of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. Um, I am Vicky's daughter, and <laughs> Regina and Stella's niece, and Sydney's cousin. Um, and I do beadwork full time. I had a panic where I couldn't, I was like, I'm pretty sure Becca's older than me, but I like, <laughs> <laughs> which is a terrible thing to not know with your cousin. Um, my name is Sydney, uh, Ani, uh, Sydney and Dishnikas, which is, my name is Sydney and Anishinaabalon. Uh, I am, as Becca said, Becca's cousin, and Vicky and Gina are my aunts, and Stella is my mother, and was the one that prompted me-ish to get in to beadwork, um, and I feed in what time I can with the time that I have, but I'm not a full-time beater. Hey, well, just to let other people in on what we discussed uh, ahead of time is that, yes, it's important to know a little bit about the history um, for of all of your experiences in this art-making wow. activity. Um, and we will hear from some of you a, a little bit about, especially about your mother's teaching uh, of, of this craft to you. But we wanna also focus most of this conversation on what this experience of being involved in the Kindred exhibition, a museum exhibition uh, in Petoskey, Michigan has meant to you in more future oriented um, aspects of like what your hopes and dreams are for you as individuals, you as a family, and you as, you know, members of your, your community. So, um, well, do we start with the oldest first? Uh, actually, actually, I drew the short straw. Oh, okay, good. I was given the honor of going first and presenting the story of White Feather's Daughters, okay. which is how we, how we all got started here. Um, professionally, we're known as White Feather's Daughters, and that goes back to our mother, who, when she retired from her work um, for the um, Emma County Probate Court, she became a, a appellate justice for the Little Traverse Bay Bands, one of our first three appellate justices, and she did a lot of travel, and during that travel, she would see other people spending their time beating on the plane or as they were traveling around, and she thought, I think I remember doing this as a child. I'd like to try this again. And so she started beating again. And by the time she passed away eight years later, she was really one of the top bead artists in the area. And you would kind of hesitate to say that because maybe not everybody would agree, but she did the most beautiful beadwork. And none of us really wanted to pick it up and learn it because mom was so good at what she did and so perfect at what she did. That it was like, I am not about to put myself up against hers. But once she passed away, I picked up the beads. She had shown me how to do it. And so I picked up the beads and I started making things just as a way of feeling her still close to me. And the others saw me doing that and they were wanting to pick up that same skill as well. And so we all three started beating and then we browbeat our nieces and children into doing it. And so we all um, decided to make it a thing and we called ourselves White Feather's Daughters because our mother's business was White Feather Dreams. And I'm gonna share a photo. This here, I'm not sure how well you can see it, mm -hmm. but this is a fourth generation photo. The face in the middle is our great grandmother. The one in the top left is our grandmother. Top right is our mother. And the baby in our arms is Vicky right here. <laughs> so that is our four generations. Um, and mom was fortunate to take a trip up to the island of Cake, Alaska, where they were working on a healing to wellness court. And the philosophy of healing to wellness is that instead of punishing people who've, who've 
done wrong, uh, who've gotten involved in drugs or alcohol, had offenses and things like that, is bring them back to a cultural awareness of, of health and help them get past those addictions through that way. And we wanted to bring that same system here to Little Travers Bay Vance. Ah, I'm so sorry. I have to back up a second. Buju, Ajin Carver, and Dijnikas, Waganakasing, Odawak, and Dao, Makwa, and Dodum, Kanwing, and Donjiba. I meant to start off with my introduction. My name is Regina Carver, and I live in the land of the Crooked Tree. And I am Bear Clan, and I live in Conway, Michigan. Um, okay, so now jumping back ahead. Uh, Mom, traveled to Cake, Alaska, and she wanted badly while she was out there to find her own eagle feather because she knew that there were eagles all over Alaska, and she just thought it would be really special to pick up her own eagle feather. So she was out there for a week's training, and she told the, the people they were that were showing them around her, her dream, her goal, and they says, oh, we know where all the eagles are. We'll find you an eagle feather. So each evening they take them out someplace, they take them down to the river, they take them down to the seashore, they took them to um, every place they could think of and mom could not find a single eagle feather. And they offered her eagle feathers and she says, no, I need to find my own. So the last night, she's kind of given up on the idea and they, they say, well, let's go to the dump because the eagles do like to scavenge and maybe we'll find one there. So they go, they're at the dump and there are eagles around there and they're looking, but they can't find a feather. And so she gives up and she starts heading back to the car. The light is fading and she's feeling like a failure. And down at her feet, she looks down and she sees a quill sticking up out of the, the gunk. And so she bends down and picks it up. And it's this dirty, draggled, ugly looking eagle feather, but it's whole, it's not broken. And so her guide says, oh, leave that here. That's, you don't want that. I'll get you, I'll get you another eagle feather. And she says, no, this is the one the creator meant for me to have. So she took it back to her hotel room and she spent the evening with that eagle feather. And she washed it in the sink. She cleaned it with soap. She uh, preened it with her fingers and she used the blow dryer on it. And she, she cleaned that eagle feather up. And when she was done, it was a beautiful, perfect white tail feather, perfect. And she realized what a metaphor that was for what the Healing to Wellness Court is, that no matter how dirty or broken you think you are, you can become whole again. You can become clean again. And that story is the basis of our Healing to Wellness Court. And it's actually named the White Feather Project. So, um, without going into a lot of her background that had a deep meaning for her. And so it does for us as well. In fact, this might be the first time I've ever gotten through the story without crying about it. Uh -huh. um, so fast forward again, several years after she passed away, we had continued to beadwork and we decided we were just going to rent a booth at our local powwow and set up tables and put our stuff out there and just have a big time with the family. And if we sell stuff, great. If not, we still had a good time. So we put out our booth and we sold enough stuff to keep us interested. And so we're, we're still not at a professional level yet, but we've been doing it ever since, except for the COVID years, of course. And we're really looking forward to this year again, setting up at the powwow. And it's just continued to grow. The beadwork is important to all of us. That's the thread that holds White Feather's daughters together. But we all branch into our own separate experiences as well. Um, I tend to think of myself as more of a textile artist. I love doing beadwork, but I also sew, I knit, um, I make clothing, and I'm a social basket maker, quill box maker. Uh, you sit me down in a group doing a craft, and I will likely try it. And I think that that's one of the greatest gifts I was given by my mother's ancestors is that ability to um, just pick stuff up like that, to sit down and see how it's made and do it. So I may never make a quill box in the quiet of my own home, but I have, have those that I've made and I could sit down with the group and make another one. Um, if I go over to, my, to Stella's house, 
I'll play with sweet grass and black ash baskets. Sure. Um, it's, it's something that comes easy to me. Um, so the kindred exhibit, we were kind of bullied into by a friend of ours who, <laughs> who has a collection of a lot of our work and also a, a pretty serious collection of, of other cultural um, arts and crafts. And she said, she told us that you should do an exhibit. And she says, I've been talking to the Crooked Tree Arts Center about having an exhibit for Native American Heritage Month. And you guys should be in it. You should be featured in it because you're three generations. And so we let her talk us into it. And when we walked in to the hall and saw all of this beautiful stuff that were done by ancestors, by old timers who have long passed on, and the great artists that we see doing stuff now. Mm -hmm. And then you walk into the exhibit hall and there's our beadwork. It was kind of life-changing. Um, we were no longer just a back room hobby. Mm -hmm. And while we're all still pretty humble about our work, it feels really good to have other people um, in the greater community look at that and, and say, you you guys do good stuff. Mm. Yeah. Um, going forward into the future, what I'm, I had, I had kind of a humbling experience with Liz or a wine at Crooked Tree when she was selecting through our, our pieces to see what she wanted to put in the exhibit. And I brought some of my best stuff and, and some pieces that my mom had given me. And they're there and she's looking at it and she says, oh, I want these pieces. And she says, what do they mean? Is there any special meaning to them? And I looked at them and I looked at her and I said, I just like to make pretty things. I just like to make things that look pretty. I sit down, I see a, a cabochon stone and I see how it should be colored or I want, there's a design that's in my head and I want to make it. That's all I'm doing. I'm just getting these designs out of my head and down on, on fiber. But in the future, what I want to do is focus on bringing back some of our old designs. Mm -hmm. When you go to a powwow now, when you go to a tribal event, you see people dressed in these bright, bold colors and geometric designs. And a lot of that comes from the Western tribes. That is not our tradition. And I'd, I'm not a believer that we can turn the clock back and live in the past, but we can honor the past in the things that we do today. So I want to make those more popular again, to bring back some of those colors and those designs, both in uh, ribbon work, applique, shawls, um, beadwork, wherever the creator takes me. That's my goal. Wow, thank you for, <laughs> that's a great, um, starting point for this conversation. And I'll just say to other people that Liz Erlewine is the director of the um, Crooked Tree Art Gallery, which is in Petoskey, which is where the exhibition started. And now it is at Michigan State University Museum for just a couple more weeks. Um, and so, um, yeah, you've given us a great introduction uh, to this family connection here. So who's up next? You must have, like the I, okay. I don't think I have to. I'm okay. I'm okay. Um yeah, like my sister, um Bape Monque and Dijnikas, Nema, Nindodam, Waganaki Sting, Odawa, Indau. Um my native name is Lapping Loon Woman. Mm -hmm. Um they I've been told I'm Sturgeon clan. And those people are teachers, I found out. So that was kind of interesting. I'm not a teacher, but I've been raising kids for a long time. A lot of teaching goes on there. But a um, non-traditional teacher. Non-traditional teacher. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Becca. People in the community often. Yeah. So um, we, I, as I mentioned in my email, we weren't really beading until we inherited our mom's beadwork. Um, I was. <laughs> For me and my family, immediate family, we, I didn't really do that. I spent a lot of time, I gather and harvest 
um, do a, I did a lot, a lot of learning and research about natural medicine and healing ways. Um, I was really sick and uh, conventional medicine wasn't working. Medications, biopsies, all that, nothing was helping until I went to some native healers and started learning about that, um, got reconnected with what I had been, you know, we had all been separated from. And so that has been a gathering, you know, just gathers the sweet grass and the, the medicines and did a lot of that. Um, we, uh, my sisters and I, we, we go sweet grass picking and um, uh, the beadwork, uh, I kind of go towards more natural things, um, like, you know, the flowers and the trees. And um, that makes me happy. And I think uh, one of the things that, that kind of describe what we're trying to do is um, give a feeling, you know, like uh, experience with our artwork. When you see it, what what is it bringing out or what are you feeling when you see it? Um, I guess I'm not really explaining myself very well, but uh, I don't really have a get a, I get inspired about something and then I'll I'll make it. Um, this the Kindred exhibit um, kind of has inspired me and given me courage. Um, there's some things I'd like to see us do. There's a art a juried art show in Harbor Springs that I've always wanted to go to, but it's I never felt like we could pull it off but now but now I think we can I think we could pull it off and um, so I've, it's given me the confidence to um, try those things and to uh, follow my intuition <laughs> about these things um, I've been pretty blessed in my life I've been able to be a stay-at-home mom mostly I uh, did I was in cosmetology for 30 years but um, most of the time I was home raising kids or somebody's kids <laughs> and uh, been able to practice being a homemaker, you know, keeping kids healthy and alive until they graduate. <laughs> so your your older sister said that she has multiple kinds of art making activities that she's been interested in. How about you? Was it just beadwork or were you did you do some other things? No, I, I do a lot. That, that would be me. I'm the, I'm the oldest. Who's the oldest? But, oh, yeah. um, I right. do like you, you've got the short straw. You're the oldest. Yeah. yeah. Um, I in, uh, started out, do, uh, I had art a lot in class. I had art in college. And then my um, ex husband uh, was a wood carver and a sign maker. And I, I started off doing painting for him and doing folk art kind of things and selling those and um, painted puffins for a guy. Um, worked a lot with driftwood and wood wood burning, painting, um, making walking sticks. Yeah, walking sticks, you know, just all of, all of that, dream catchers. I've done a lot of those and just those kind of things we did and then picked up the beadwork. Oh, there, here's some of the, I, I've been playing with birch bark and uh, started making flowers. Uh, people really like those. Um, your medicinals? The green stuff and oh, your yeah. herbals. Yeah. So like I said about gathering mm -hmm. and harvesting, um, making I, I make this skincare stuff for the family and um teas for colds and flu to help ease that and make it better and cramps. Yeah, the <laughs> moon time teas. Moon time teas and you know, all that kind of stuff that helps the family, you know, along, try to keep us out of the doctor's office as much as possible. I mean, not to say you shouldn't go, but there's things you can do to kind of stay out of there a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so those those are some of the things that I, I've done in the past. And um, I like to do them all. And I, I kind of like do things throughout the year. I don't just do one thing. You know, start off gathering in the spring, harvesting and the vending, the powwows and stuff, and then come wintertime, then we make drums. You know, I, I make drums and sing. We used to sing in a group, had a group that we sang with. That was a lot of fun. Learned, that was a good way for me to learn the language, you know, because I wasn't raised with it. So I really enjoyed that, singing with my lady friends. And um, that's just kind of came and gone. And actually, 
you know, just in all of your introductions so far, I've just been, um, it's just lovely to hear your language, the Anishinaabewim, um, that you are just trilling off your tongues. And um, we had a friend overnight last night at our own home who was raised um, in a family that only spoke that language. And yeah. it's hard, it's hard, but she went to um, holy childhood and, and so got disrupted. And so it, it's hard for her to, you mm -hmm. know, she has the ear for it. So it's just lovely to hear your, you speaking it. Well, we've been told that you cannot separate the language from the culture. Without our language, we aren't a culture. And so they try to introduce everybody to as much of it as they can. And that too is another gift I think that our ancestors have given us is the ability to pick up that language when we hear it. So are you able to use that language when you're making um, beadwork at all? I mean, do you have terms that you can, I mean, could you describe the process of making beadwork or the designs or anything? In the language? No. no, no. It's like important to understand that like, you know, even though we've been going to language palaces and like, you know, introduced to language throughout our lives, we're not immersed in it. It right. is extremely difficult to learn without being immersed in it. So we really try to use the words that we do know, you know, whenever we can. So we'll put in the word for an animal or we'll use our numbers or like a plant, you know, and then the rest will be in English. And when we, when we harvest the materials that we use for those things, like for instance, um, when Stella does the black ash baskets, you know, we, we'll go out to collect that in a good way. We'll offer the tobacco to that tree because it's giving its life so that we can continue our way of life. Um, when we go out to gather sweet grass, we'll, we'll offer tobacco to those spirits that are out there. We went and, or I went and harvested cedar for the first time this year. So we put Sema down for that, for those trees. And so we're, so we're trying to honor that and also to use their names as much as we can. You know, if I put down Sema for sweetgrass, I'm not going to call it sweetgrass. I'm going to say wingush. Yeah. Which is the word. For clarity, Sema is tobacco. That's the yes. translation. You see me. I feel like we should probably <laughs> skip to the next person. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we're running. Oh, well, oh, um, we do. I'm just going to say that we have somebody who's raised their hand, and I'm wondering if it's a question that um, we might be able to answer right now. So it's Christine Mitchell. Um, we have these student helpers. Oh, oh, you know. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we know Christine. Oh, you know. So do you know what her name is? She's family as That's well. Okay, you could ask. You can ask She's, a question. Christine, a family. go ahead and ask a question. Uh, Christine, you're able to use your microphone. Unmute. <laughs> she went run into the little girl's room, I guess. <laughs> We'll get back to her later. Okay, well, maybe uh, Christine, you could put oh. the, is she there? If oh. not, she could put the question into the chat and we'll come back to it. We're not ignoring her. No. <laughs> you don't know Christine, but Christine won't let you ignore her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, who's up next? I guess um, I guess I am. Okay. Um, I am not, I have not been as immersed in the culture as my two sisters. Um, I, I moved away from the area for a lot of years and I came back about 10 years ago and I'm trying. So you were talking about how lovely it is to hear introductions in the language. You're not gonna get that from me. Sorry, I'll say on E, right? <laughs> Um, but uh, I did like Regina's comment about the Kindred exhibit about how we were sort of bullied. I would say flat out bullied <laughs> into it. Um, I, I wasn't given a choice. Um, my, our friend had been trying to 
pitched this idea to me for a couple of years. And I'm like, mm, yeah, as I mentioned to you, Marsha, I'm not a real confident artist. Um, I come into this creative thing late in life. Um, I was the person to balance the checkbooks. You know, I do an ace job with that. But um, my sisters have always been wildly creative. I mean, from I share a room with Gina and she was always <laughs> sewing things and I'm stepping on needles and pins. You know, she, she's always been wildly creative and Vicki, the same thing. She entered a contest that, you know, won it when she was in middle school or high school. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll balance your checkbook. So, <laughs> you know, so I, I haven't been real confident about this whole thing. And my mom, she had started to introduce the idea to me um, shortly before she walked on that she thought that I would enjoy beadwork, right? Because I was doing a lot of cross stitch, right? There's one behind me right there. So I did a lot of cross stitch and I filled all my rooms and she was like, you need to move on. And I think you would really like beadwork. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, you know, and I just kind of ignored her for a while. Um, just like you'd like golf, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Mom, she, she just pushed real hard sometimes. And, um, but when she passed, she just left this huge, huge hole in my world. I, I had no idea how big of a role she had played in my life until she was gone. And I was having a really hard time, I'm gonna cry, I was having a really hard time dealing with that. And I had gotten a lot of her beads. And for a while I was afraid to use them because I felt that if I used them, you know, I would just be wasting them, right? I, I needed them to be something special. So, you know, I put it off and then finally I'm like, okay, Gina, everybody goes to Gina when they want to learn something new because she can do everything. I'm like, how does this work? Right. And I've, I've had a hard time trying to get creative inspiration. Right. And when you are stuck and you don't have creative inspiration, the people to talk to are my two sisters. They have ideas just poofing out of their ears. They're just, <laughs> they're just ideas everywhere. So um, Gina helped me get going. And I, you know, eventually I've reached a point now where I view almost everything now through a lens of whether or not that would make a good medallion, right? You know, I'll, I'll look at, I had a Christmas card you know, I, I, the fox that's on exhibit there, mm -hmm. that was a Christmas card, okay? And I was looking at it, and I'm like, man, that would be really neat. I wonder if I could do that. And Sydney's familiar with this. I have white whales, right? Because I'll see something, and I'm like, boy, that would be really pretty. I'm wandering through the airport and in Minnesota, and I see a tile mural on the wall. And I'm like, that, that would be beautiful, right? And so I had to, you know, I'm almost late for my plane, but I had to stop and take a picture of it because everything I see is, it took me such a long time to tap into this. Now I can't seem to shut it off. <laughs> but, um, that you know, happens. I, what, what, you know? I said that happens. Yeah. So I don't know. I was trying to figure out how to deal with my grief and I started beating and it is it has just been life-changing for me to be able to to do that to I feel close to my mom when I'm beating I just I can feel her presence with me when I beat when I'm having problems and I'm trying to figure things out I bead right in my hands I feel her in my hands yeah so 
Um, so back to my our friend who's bullied us, right? She was like, well, you guys should be doing this. Who will remain unnamed, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so she was like, well, you should do this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, but I'm not going to put myself out there, right? Because I'm not real confident about it. And I like, like Vicki, I, I like, or Gina, I like making pretty pictures, right? I, you know, I want to see what I can make. And so I get a phone call from this friend one day and she was like, I've done something you're not gonna be happy about. <laughs> I'm like, okay. She said, well, you weren't going in. So I pitched the idea, she loves it. They're gonna do the exhibit this fall, <laughs> All right? We didn't even get bullied, we just got pushed. Bulldozed. <laughs> right just got full-fledged pushed into it and I'm like ah, freaking out because you know I'm Vicky and Gina get really mad at me because I say I'm not creative but yeah I know they get mad at me oh look Sydney's saying it too <laughs> <laughs> but when you when you spend 45 50 years not thinking of yourself as creative it's a little hard to suddenly Flip. I just have to chime in that this is the same woman that sent me a picture and was like, this is a picture of an eagle. Do you think I can beat this? And then like five hours later, I get the eagle half finished. And she's like, I think it's going okay. What do you think? And then like five more hours, like, I don't know. And I'm like, what did you do? So you're very good. Very good. All right. So, but, you know, but, it does sound like you, this has um, helped you through grief. Yes. It's also connected you to your mother. Sounds yes. like it's also connected you even stronger to your sisters. Yes. 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 Um, you know, without getting into the gory details, when we were growing up, we weren't particularly close. Silos. Silos. Four <laughs> silos. We have we have a younger brother yet. Okay. But we were four silos growing up in in this house because of the dysfunction elsewhere. And um, this has really helped pull us together. It, when I need my sister time, I'll call them up and I'm like, we're gonna make sweetgrass baskets. Sid's gonna teach me how to make a sweetgrass basket. And God bless those girls, they're over here. <laughs> they're over here and we're working on sweetgrass baskets. Um, it's. Okay, it, so it's, there's no regret about being bullied into this exhibit. No, no, no regret. But, but it was like, don't give the friend any ideas. No, <laughs> so don't give her any ideas, right? Yeah. Uh, let's yeah. move to the, the next generation. Okay. Next generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, which of the next generation would like to go first? I can go first. Okay. <laughs> or Sydney, she just screamed. I know. Um, well, my name is Becca. Um, I'm the owner of Queer Quay Designs. So I started that about four years ago. Um, the intention behind my beadwork is uh, to create representation for LGBTQ and two-spirit indigenous peoples within a cultural space. Um, and I've been, I've had such an amazing experience so far. You know, I've gotten to do you know, talks and workshops and all of that, but Kindred was probably like the best experience of them all. You know, like I never, I started this work when I was away downstate, living downstate. Um, and then I came up here and shortly after I came up here, then we were all working on this exhibit together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just been a really amazing experience. You know, I feel like I've watched the three of them, their confidence grow so much as artists and as people and as speakers throughout this process, which has made me so happy because I've just grown up this whole time and they're so down on themselves sometimes and to like undercharging for their work and not valuing themselves the way that I think they should value themselves. So I feel like that has been a really beautiful part. Um, the fact that all of our beadwork with my grandma's beadwork was there was such an amazing feeling. Yes um that work has never lived together you mm -hmm. know and I feel like the entire exhibit both rooms there was such an energy in there you know all of these old pieces and new pieces together 
for the first time. It was a really beautiful thing. Um, I How feel like your own creative path. I mean, when you were young, my own creative path. Well, it was a bit rocky. You know, I never considered myself a creative person. I really didn't. I didn't consider myself an artist growing up. You know, much like Aunt Stella. Um, you know, because I had a family of artists. My brother was really artistic. My mom was really artistic. My aunt was really artistic. Um, and I really wasn't. Not I was really aunt. into school and stuff. So. Um, and then it wasn't, and I tried beating when I was younger. You know, I wasn't bad at it, but I didn't really like it. She, was a bully she bullied me constantly. <laughs> but, you know, she was constantly telling me to shut up and start beating <laughs> because I would just talk and talk and talk. And I would move around and I would like not want to sit still with myself because especially as a kid, you know, I was really closeted. I was really uncomfortable in my own body, you know, as like a young closeted queer person, I was uncomfortable with emotion. And when you slow down and you sit with it and beadwork makes you sit with it, you know, it makes you be present. It makes you be meditative. Mm -hmm. um, that was too much for me as a kid with everything I had going on internally. Um, and it wasn't until I really came to terms with my queerness and my two-spirit identity and all of that and was out and comfortable with that, that beating came back into my life. Huh. It came back into my life when I was in a really bad place. You know, I had been out to Standing Rock for two different trips and had a lot of PTSD. I was dealing with an institution where our voices were not heard as Native students. Um, on top of, you know, a lot going on back here in the community and with my family. And I didn't know how to manage it all, you know? And then I had this idea for queer play designs and making pride beadwork and bringing that like in community space because that's what I needed when I was growing up and I didn't have it. Um, and once I had that idea and started, you know, beading, I couldn't stop. These last four years, I'm just beating all the time. I have so many ideas in my head mm -hmm. all the time. I have so many projects I want to do. I have so many places I want to go and teach beadwork, you know. Um, and it was it was much like Aunt Stella said. You know, I didn't realize our stories were like different, but kind of similar in this aspect. Like, I didn't get to know my grandma very personally as a kid. You know, I was pretty young when she passed away. And when I started beating, it really felt like she was there with me, you know, and it felt like any problem that I was having, you know, I would just have a moment of brilliance, you know, and I feel like she was just like telling me what to do in those moments um, to keep moving forward. Um, I was really nervous about starting it. You know, there's a lot of homophobia and transphobia in our communities due to colonization and compulsory Christianity and boarding schools and these rigid binaries that were put on our people, you know? And it's not a traditional way. Two-spirit people were always accepted. Two-spirit people were embraced. There was a lot of fluidity and gender and sexuality traditionally. And that was not only okay, but that was sacred. Um, and I feel like it was really hard for me growing up to know that that was sacred, but also know that there was so much hatred in our own communities, you know? Um, and I feel like I spent a lot of time being angry about all of those things. And then it just kind of like a flip switched. And yes, I'm still angry about those things, but I feel like I, we can do something about it, you know? Like I want to be a good ancestor to those that come next. I want to make sure they feel safer than I did. I want to make sure that they are embraced in our community and celebrated the way that they should be. And so I made a really active choice to be very, very out, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm not just, yay, like I'm super queer and my whole business is super queer and I'm wearing rainbows wherever I go because I want people to know that I'm a safe person. Um, and with the Kindred exhibit, it was a really big moment when I gave an artist talk. Um, at the for the exhibit which i think is available on the Kirkatree website but and i will just intersect here people should watch it it is on the crooked tree site um it, it's a beautiful um talk becca thank you thank you but that talk was the first time my mom and my aunt ever got to hear me speak 
you know, I've given talks down at U of M and EMU and I did workshops down there, but I hadn't gotten to do that up here. And this is where I want to be doing it. Um, and like the fact that I never thought I would move back here. I never thought there was space for my queerness in this community up here, not just the tribal community, but the community at large. You know, I never thought I would be able to be at peace up here again. And that has changed so much for me. You know, I am fully embraced by my community and my family. And there are people that don't agree with what I'm doing, you know, and that's, I don't care anymore. You know, I cared a lot before and I just don't care anymore because I'm not doing this for myself. Mm -hmm. One ways I'm doing this for my inner child to heal and all of that, but I'm doing that for the youth you know this summer I got to work with uh teach beating workshops with the tribal youth camps and it has been such an amazing experience um but just like being able to be up there and speak confidently about the history of our people and the way that we have survived all of these years of colonialism by our arts and by our culture you know we have survived in this tourist economy and it has not been pretty but we are still here and that is beautiful yeah, you, um, and you um, express your identity in your work. I mean, could yeah. you describe some of the things that you do? Yeah. Yeah. So what I do is I, I mean, I'm sorry, that are in the exhibit. Yeah, too. Oh, yeah, that are in the exhibit. So, well, in general, I use pride flags. So I use contemporary pride flags with traditional beadwork, right? So I'm trying to bring us into a modern space and remind people that we're still here and remind people that our queerness is sacred and always has. That's one of the medallions I made there that my cousin Sydney is wearing right now. Um, and so I use like a lot of rainbows, but a lot of, you know, the bisexual pride flag, pansexual pride flag, transgender pride flag, non-binary, um, whatever ones I can get the beads for. <laughs> um, but for the exhibit, I, it's my biggest piece I've ever done. Um, and so that's that big piece that's framed in the Good Heart Artist Residency Program, which I was a resident there last year. Um, it has the, she asked me to make something, you know, I didn't, I had no direction. I could do whatever I wanted with it. She was like, here's a budget to work with. Just make something because I want people to know that are coming here, that this is on Odawa lands. Mm -hmm. And I want that represented in the artist residency. Um, and so I decided on that big two-spirit pride flag. And then I have more traditional like florals, Ojibwe florals um, in the different colors around it. Um, and that pride flag, it's contemporary. The term two-spirit is contemporary. You know, that term, the actual term was created in the 90s, you know, to reclaim that space that we traditionally held. And, you know, I mean, each tribal community has their own teachings for two-spirit people, and they have their own names for two-spirit people. And so it's kind of like this umbrella term that we use today now. Um, but that was a feat in itself, just with how big that project was, you know, and trying to figure out how to put it together and all of that. But I was really proud of how it came out. Um, I also have on display, I try to do like pronoun patches and the pronoun pins. Um, so I have three pronoun badges there. You know, I have the he, him, she, her, and they, them um, up on exhibit. I definitely wanna do more with the pronoun work because I feel like it's a very, very simple way to show your respect and support for other people is to, res you don't have to understand their identity to be respectful. Mm -hmm. and to use the words and the terms that they want to be referred to as. Um, and I feel like it's not something we really talk about in our community, but our language itself is so beautiful and it's not gendered. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have a, we, I mean, we have a word for a man and a woman, but like our terms are not gendered. The pronoun for a person is all the same. It doesn't matter how they're expressing themselves what their body parts are, how they feel inside. It's just a person, you know? And I think that, that was a really powerful moment for me of realizing that it wasn't always like this, you know? And it's not supposed to be like this in our communities. And it's time to heal and it's time to move forward. It sounds like you have found um, a place back living in um, 
the Harbor Springs, Petoskey area is a much more comfortable place for you now. Yeah, because I'm much more comfortable with myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I have the strength and the confidence to not be tore up when I see homophobic or transphobic things or when I hear misogynistic comments. You know, I feel like that was a lot of the internal work I did on top of knowing that my family and my community support me. Mm -hmm. You know, I was featured in my tribal newspaper all about my business and a lot of people reached out afterward and, you know, and it's really beautiful and I feel supported and loved and so I can fight that hate and fight the dark, you know? You know what? You're, you're already answering one of the questions I wanted to ask you all. Um, sorry. Which, no, 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 this is good because I wanted to, to um, explore how the community at large has reacted to your your work and on display but i don't want to go there until i hear from sydney oh hi <laughs> the other gen next generation um okay okay I have some disjointed thoughts that I wanted to share based off of some of the things that my family has said, but also just, um, okay. So the question was about what kindred exhibit has meant to me mm -hmm. and where that was part of it. So with that, I think it's, it's kind of funny because I also like to sometimes undervalue my work. So I was like, okay, well, it's nice to be involved. Like, I'm glad that people want to see this. This is cool. Um, but I'm really like, it's been really, bolstering to know that it got a positive reception and that people are interested and they want to know more about beadwork and recognize it like it's it's someone in my neighborhood and I'm not living near the tribe I don't live up there asked me this week if I had seed beads in the design and it was it was very powerful to me to know that somebody recognized what the work was and was familiar with it and valued it. And so having that be furthered by having the exhibit and having people care enough to go see it and learn about it and be interested is really um, powerful to me. And then it also has, a, it's had a, it's been very important to me because um, I think you can tell we all very much care about Rita who was our, my aunt's and mother's mom and Becca and I's grandma. And she had such a big impact and it's also very important to me that she is having her work seen and valued and and cared about and that it's that it's out there. So that's that's hugely important to me, more so than words can express. So that's been very big. What um, is your own artwork like? What does my own artwork look like? A hodgepodge. Um, <laughs> um, I have gone through some phases. I think. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, so I go on Pinterest a lot, to be honest, to get inspiration, but I've shifted as, so it started out that I would do things that felt achievable because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. The first time that I ever did a beadwork piece was for my mother. And ironically, something that my mom said earlier today, I thought, so, no, Becca said earlier, one of them said earlier, that was hilarious to me. That was everybody goes to Gina when they're trying to learn something new, because that's exactly what I did when I tried to go learn how to beat, because I was trying to surprise my mother. And I was like, well, I can't ask her how to do it. So I went to my aunt and got all this advice. And so the very first piece I did was like a, like a over a hill with like little buildings in the distance and like a sunset. And it was like very ambitious for a first piece. Cause it was like way more than like three colors, which is what I probably could have started with. Um, and because I think I started there and because my mom has always said, like she said, having that white whale perspective of pick something that seems impossible and seems out of like out of reach and just go for it and see what happens. So I have started with just like whatever I see. I'm like, yeah, okay, let's try that. Let's see where this goes. Let's find out how this goes. And then if I go and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. She's like, it's a white whale. Just give it your best shot. It'll turn out okay. <laughs> and so I... <laughs> I've ended up doing a lot of nature things. Um, I came like with everything prepared to like tell people that, but like, um, I really like nature. I really like doing um, like landscape kind of things. And I use paintings for inspiration a lot. So things, I think that I feel a lot of peace when I 
am out in nature. And so if I find a place that makes me feel like I'm calm and comfortable and like I can breathe easily, that I oftentimes want to be that, mm -hmm. which if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So something I did was based off of a painting, but it's a person just like walking lonely down a beach with the wind going. And I feel like that's such a feeling that you get when you can feel wind in your hair and against your face and like it's a cloudy day and you can just feel the weather and hear the sound of waves. And so something that kind of in, like expresses that emotion is something that I want to be, which has become very challenging because that doesn't always start out easy. And you're doing <laughs> in beads and beads so it um it's it's interesting it goes so i just like a lot of nature that's the shorter answer is i like to do a lot of nature i like to do things that are probably less traditional um and i do have interest in doing more traditional things as i go along and expanding into that realm but i think i've i've just done a lot of nature lately so i do like sunsets over water trees forests um under the stars is something that i want to do i like the sun and the moon and all that and yeah so right now I'm working on some stuff that I um, hope might fit because I was talking with Becca about things that might go under her mm. umbrella. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on some dream catcher themed things that have pride flight colors around them. Mm. And so, yeah, but. Well, you're already um, starting to touch on one of the other questions I wanted to hear some of you talk about, which is, you know, there's this dynamic about tradition and innovation mm -hmm. and um one of my friends always said that you know tradition is always change um and that you you are like, just with your description of you know the person walking with the wind in the hair in beadwork um and becca what you were describing in terms of your work i mean th those are like pushing um th the notion of what's traditional and um, do you think you can keep pushing and it be still considered Odawa? I know that's a provocative question, but I'd lo love to hear all of your, your thoughts about that is when is it, you know, what retains the Odawa identity? I have, I have strong opinions about this oh, subject. Go ahead. I, I also have first. strong opinions about that subject. I'm curious to hear it. You know? <laughs> so, I used to work for a tribal health department. I'm a retired registered nurse and I worked in the community health department. And we had a grant that had allowed us to purchase snowshoes for kids. Hmm. And they were the aluminum snowshoes with the plastic bindings. And as we're working with these, I'm thinking, well, you know, it's, it's, these are nice, but it's too bad we don't have traditional ones. And then I got to thinking, wait a minute, if the old ones had had aluminum snowshoes with plastic bindings on them or polar fleece or yeah, any one of these innovations we have, of course they would have used them. They used what worked, whatever they had, that's what they used. So in a sense, tradition does evolve with each generation because knowledge builds on knowledge. And if you look at say in beadwork, traditionally you think of beadwork as floral or geometric. They were a lot of times copying the embroidered clothing that they saw the Europeans come in. And then they took it to, took that, those beads and those designs and started looking at the things around them and doing more natural things. But a lot of times when you look at old beadwork, you'll see um, flowers and things that come from Europe or Asia. They're not, they're not traditionally here at all. We copied what we saw. Hmm. And if our vision evolves, our, artistry will follow and there will always be that thread of us who stays traditional you know like you're talking about but the fact that these other people on the outskirts are doing something different doesn't mean that they're not also traditional can i is that clear enough that? sydney please do oh me oh i'm in full yeah. agreement yes, you, I'm, <laughs> i have just very but, strong opinions about this so I recognize that I said I was I did less traditional beadwork, but that is not to say in any sense that it won't one day be traditional or that just by like inherently by being Odawa, what we do is still Odawa work and it is still authentic in its own right. And there is no taking away from that. And I mm -hmm. get, I will get soapboxy <laughs> in some <laughs> situations because the, 
there's just the history of taking native communities, native peoples, native artwork, and then like putting it in a box and saying like, this is what that is. This is what this community looks like. This is what that will always be. And that's so like harmful. And I have many un words I can say about that. So I just, I, mm, I'm trying to like contain myself. Um, <laughs> I, there has so, been so much harm done by trying to create a just stamp something and say that's the picture of what that looks like and if you're not that then you don't qualify or you aren't considered native or you don't fit in this community or you're wrong or you need to get like you need to change to meet this expectation and so um I just I'm I'm very tradition can build and change yeah Becca <laughs> I see you next. anyway tradition can build and change and everything that we do just inherently by doing it and putting our heart into it matters and that is still perfect so oh and rant. Yeah, well, even the idea that there might be something that is Odawa art is colonial. Mm -hmm. Everything that we create in our community is Odawa art. It doesn't matter when Anstel is doing embroidery, what she's still creating, it was made by an Odawa person. Yeah. You know, like, and when it comes to my work, like, yeah, I mean, rainbows, every, a lot of people use rainbows. It's just the intentions behind them that's different for me. You know, and in a lot of ways, I am being decolonial in the way that I'm honoring and creating space for two spirit, gender variant, sexual identity variant peoples. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a very decolonial way of thinking and taking that out of those boundaries and rejecting those Western binaries. You know, I'm bringing it back to tradition by doing those things. Don't well, our young people make us proud? Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just <laughs> along, along this line, and this is just because um, my own research interest is in quilts, and um, there is a quilt in the Kindred exhibition, and um, I once worked with the National Museum of the American Indian on an exhibition of native quilts, and uh, an Odawa quilt was in there. But a lot of people said, um, oh, we had no idea that Indians quilted. Well, you know, <laughs> so it can't be, you know, is this an Indian art, a native art? But, um, you know, that's a beautiful quilt that was included in the Kindred exhibition. And, you know, for me, it, it's, it's not an, Anglo, it's not a colonial, it's, it's an Odawa art piece. I don't know. I'd love to hear your ideas about that. Well, if it's not, um, if quilting is not an Indian thing, then somebody needs to let NCAI, the National Congress of American Indians know, because I just attended their conference and they were awarding quilts to people <laughs> that were retiring that were longstanding members of NCAI. So I'm sure Gina has a thought on quilts also. I think it was. You're on the spot. <laughs> I, it's the same thing as what I said earlier. If we saw something, we did it. Mm -hmm. And if, if the quilt that you're talking about is the same one I'm thinking about, it's a star quilt mm -hmm. and it's got the floral patterns yes. around the outside edge that are applique on. That is purely native vision. The color choice, and the the design and the fact that she did all of those stitches by hand that is that is more beautiful than a, a traditional quilt could be considered if you ask me but i'm biased <laughs> <laughs> thank you well the woman who stayed overnight with me last night uh her grandmother uh, odawa grandmother made one just like that one i have another comment Am I still? Oh, yeah. I'm Go not. Ahead. Okay. You can um, also make comments. Yeah. Something I had also meant to say earlier, but I forgot, but it also ties in well with this. Um, uh, my brain is blurring, but I think Becca was the one that had mentioned it had been very wonderful to see the generations, including our grandmother's work in the exhibit. And I fully stand by that. Something that I love is seeing our different styles because we do all have different style and you start to know, like, I mean, I feel like it gets familiar like you look at a piece and like you're like no that's by so-and-so because you know that because you know what their style is you get used to that um 
But in that inherent piece is another great example about how each of us might have our own style and we don't do the same type of beadwork, but that's all still consistent within the, within the artistry of beadwork and what we do. And it's all still valid as what it is being beadwork. I tapered off at the end, but you know, <laughs> if that didn't make sense, let me know. If it didn't make sense, let me know. But it's all valid despite being very different and it all takes up space in a wonderful way. There's a tradition among other cultural groups of family patterns, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you can recognize a piece sure. um, by their family connections. For instance, Aaron knitting um, over in Scotland or Ireland, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, they knitted certain patterns into their sweaters so that if a fisherman was washed overboard, and they found him later, they would know who he belonged to. There's, um, and you see that also some in Indian designs, not because we fell over boats, but you would see certain patterns belonging to certain families and you can recognize um, those, those pieces by that work. For instance, um, the, the teacher that taught us how to make black ash baskets, she can look at a basket that I find at a secondhand store and tell me, oh, this was made by Joe so-and-so's family. You can tell because of this feature on it. Um, the same thing with Yvonne Walker. She can look at somebody else's quill box, whether they signed it or not, and know, oh, this is so-and-so's family because of this, you know, maybe the way they cut the points on the inside of the box or something, you know. So you, you, you can recognize those things. Well, and, wait, yeah. somebody's gonna say something. One of you. Okay, well, I'll just say, how is your wider family reacting to you? I mean, I'm, you said you've got a brother in the mix here, and you've got other family members. How did they feel about, you know, this, this group of five? Well, they tell us we should give up our day jobs. <laughs> No, I'm just no. joking. I'm just Everybody joking. Did not. Not. They no, did not. In fact, this tickles me no end. Um, as you can tell by looking at us, we are not pure Native American. We had a white father and a Native mother. And one, my, one of my father's last remaining sisters, she's 88, she's going to be 88 years old. Um, 89. She is, she's going to be 89. She, to, she made sure she told each of us that I would really love to come to the powwow and see your work. She says, I don't think I could be she here all, all day, but she's she's going to be coming to Yay! the powwow. Sorry, that's she's so proud of us. She says, I had no idea you girls did all this work. <laughs> She'd come to the exhibit. Oh. She lives at one of the local um, retirement villages. And she there's a strong history of bullying in this family. She bullied the <laughs> activities director <laughs> in bringing a bus full of residents over to the exhibit because she wanted to see us see our work and hear us speak. Okay, oh, here, yes. you might, you might as well give a, pro, a promo right now for when is the powwow and where is it? The, the powwow is the 13th and 14th of August. That's the second Saturday and Sunday in August. And it's at our tribal government center, which is on the corner of Pleasant View and Hathaway Road in Harbor Springs. Thank you. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good right. one. Finally. <laughs> so excited. Yay. Yeah. Okay. So, canceled two years. Just so it's that you all know, I already hooked up Aunt Martha with a ride. So it should oh, be okay. okay. All right. Um, we get this family stuff sorted out right now. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. My our family is supportive. Yeah. yeah. No, it's really wonderful. I mean, I can, you all are in virtual spaces right now. I ju can just only imagine when you're all in the same room together. Oh my. <laughs> um, okay. So, so I do, I do see that there's a raised hand from uh, Diana Sewell. Uh, Denise? My sister. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yes, I will. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of things. Diana, you have permission to to uh, activate your microphone now, if you'd like to ask your question. No, I have a question. I was just going to answer the question. Their family is on the line and thinks they're all very impressive. Oh. oh <laughs> that's lovely. Okay, yeah. so, so that, that answers that question I had for you all. So, all right. Does this, 
on a serious note, um, does this experience working with the Crooked Tree Art Gallery Center and the um, Michigan State University Museum now, the second venue, um, has it changed your idea of what museums do or could do in terms of working with um, communities? Yes. Um, yes. Another strong opinion. Um, a lot of, I, I, knew, I knew a woman who used to go to the, tr the local schools mm -hmm. and she would go in dressed in street clothes. And as she was talking to the class, the, these students, she would begin one by one to put on the pieces of her regalia until she was fully dressed and looking like she was ready to dance. And the point she was making is that we are still here. And the kindred exhibit shows not just the roots of our community, but the future. You know, we are one family of many. There are many families that do a particular art form. There's families of basket makers, quill workers, bead workers, um, ribbon applique workers. Again, and, yeah. And we are all we're all still very much alive, and we believe in honoring the seven generations. Mm -hmm. And if I consider myself the center, I'm the fourth generation. I knew three generations back. My great grandmother. Mm -hmm. I walked on the earth at the same time as my grandmother and my mother, and now I know two more generations gone past. I have nieces and great nieces and nephews. And I hope someday to see that seventh generation and it's linking these together that keeps mm -hmm. us alive. As long as I'm holding the hands of both of those generations, my grand great grandparents are still alive. And that means that theirs are too. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what she said. Right. <laughs> Tina always pretends that she's the shy retiring type, but she's not. <laughs> she is not. Um, it's, I, I think I had mentioned to you, Marsha, in, mm -hmm. in the email that, um, you know, I, I just, despite everything that the Western society has tried to do to us, uh, you know, going, they tried to move us to a reservation. Well, we, we figured out a way to stay where we're at, right? They, you know, they've done all of these things, boarding schools, holy childhood, uh, you know, uh, just sterilization. Away from your know. families and put into foster homes. Mm -hmm. Right. Just my my mother mm -hmm. put into a foster home, right? Outright just, murder, genocide has happened yeah, in right. this country. Yeah, uh, the inability to practice our religions mm -hmm. until the 1970s, right? We were the last group to be allowed to vote in this country. We were the original people, and we were the last group allowed to vote. This country, this government is based on our teachings, but we weren't <laughs> allowed to vote. <laughs> right. So I, it was just really important to me to see all of the work that's out there in one space and seeing, I mean, and this is gonna sound horrible, but watching the, the white community walk through and be amazed mm -hmm. that we were there, that we're still here and we're not going anywhere, Yeah. right? We're here. I think that um, in terms of like the idea of the question you had asked, Marta, was just about like changing idea of what museums do mm -hmm. and can do, correct? Correct. Okay, so with what my mom said, I think that there is that idea of museums being just snapshots of the past only. So mm -hmm. bouncing off of what my mom and my aunt said, it's that piece of its current, present, and future as well as past and that linkage together, which I don't think I had expected. So that had been a wonderful reframe on what museums can do in terms of revital, like helping the revitalization of uh, an awareness of culture. Yes. I also think that a really big part of why the Kindred exhibit was as special as it was is because they took their time with it. Mm -hmm. Liz, and, Liz Irwine and Eric Hemingway with the Tribal Archives and Records worked together 
with the community to see what we wanted up there and we wanted shown. Mm -hmm. You know, they took the time. This was not just for the non-native community to look at and to consume. This was also the first time these pieces were being put together like that. This was the first time our art was on display in a real appreciative way in our homelands, you know, in that way. And it's not just an afterthought and it's not what they wanted to see versus, you know, like it was Absolutely. such a collaborative design for the whole thing. And I think that if we can do more exhibits like that, then I think there's a beautiful space to show our cultures, you know, around- so much intention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the intentions. And for a really long time, museums' intentions were not good. Not good. We we're quite bad. Another soapbox, another day. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a museum worker, you know, I can, I, you know, I agree with you. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we have created. Uh, I, well, certainly, um, it, you know, Eric and and Liz and you all working together created a, a beautiful thing, and I'm just thankful that we were able to extend the life of what is an ephemeral uh, event an exhibition mm -hmm. to have it in a, a different location to actually, you know, out of the community, but in a space where other people, other audiences can see it and um, continue to convey the kind of intentionality that you all, um, you know, put into this uh, wonderful exhibition. Hey, we, you know what, we're, we're down to like 10 minutes. So is there any last thing each one of you would like to say that you feel like you uh, um, didn't say already? Um, one thing that might sound kind of weird that I'd like to mention about when I do my work and I'm sure my sisters do too and, and niece and daughter, but maybe unintentionally is that when I'm working on something, um, I am channeling energy into it or receiving energy and channeling energy. And I'm focusing on lovely thoughts and hoping that that energy is transferred to whoever has it when they, yeah. So that's just you, something who like has it or even who just simply looks at it and admires it. Yeah. Even that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Does and I think, sense? yeah, absolutely. And energy is always transforming, you know? I feel like a lot of us have relied on beadwork in times that were hard, you know? We, trans we took those emotions and those things that we didn't know how to get out, we didn't know how to express, and we transformed them into something beautiful. You know, energy is just energy. It can be transformed and let go in all of these different ways that makes me good think of a piece that I, it's, right. there is a piece on display that I did that's of the earth, just like a um, outward view of the globe mm -hmm. from one side and just like beaded with all the countries in it. And I did that during a time when the world was not doing as well um, because unfortunately those times definitely happen. And, um, and so it was my effort at thinking about the connectivity of us as people with everyone else and how we're all working together to continue striving and living and but like thriving on this world even in these tough times so absolutely like there is so much intention that goes into it and I hope that that is brought to anyone that sees the exhibit too. Yeah, and, and Sydney I was thinking that um, I don't know if what you were speaking of was you know in reaction to COVID but that was something I wondered like in this for then <laughs> okay in this particular last two years um, mm -hmm. where you know we've had crazy politics and and COVID and um, a lot just wonder it's been a lot um, a lot of people have you know turn to artistic pursuits to be able to cope with this period of time. But is there anything about COVID in particular that that um, changed the kind of art you did or why you did it? Probably well, we just made us want to do it more, sorry. Yeah. I think we had more time to sit at home and bead. <laughs> yeah, uh, when, when I am, troubled and bothered by things, right? 
and I have to, when I need processing, I, Rebecca mentioned it earlier, right? That when you bead, you, you know, for me, it's a very Zen kind of thing. You know, my management class, you know, you know they, they would have called it something else, but it's, it's the thing that makes you slow down and it allows me to breathe, right? Mm -hmm. And so when COVID was happening and we didn't really know what was going on being, you know, being the vice chair of the tribe, you know, worrying about the 4,500 citizens that we have and trying to figure out how to keep them safe. And, you know, it was a lot to process. So I, I got a lot of beating done. <laughs> I got a lot of beating done. We're, 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 we're actually just coming to the, the end of our session. It just flew by. But um, I will, I don't think, Denise, it, um, I don't see any other questions. Um, but if there are, could you let me know? Sure, I don't see any questions here. Uh, but if you would like to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A. And we'll ask our panelists to address them. We'll wait just a moment. Anybody even watching? No. <laughs> yes. Let's see, Karen commented that she loved us. Well, Karen, we love you too. <laughs> Karen, thank you. Karen. Karen's also family. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, listen, um, I, I I can't thank you each um, uh, more than I can say that you know, it's just been delightful having this conversation with you. I appreciate your comments ahead of time. Uh, I'm sorry, at one point I was referring to you as quill workers. My bad. Um, <laughs> but and Christine um, Mitchell notes that she's very proud of you. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> okay. yeah. Good, you've got another comment there. Um, yeah, it's just been great to hear your personal perspectives, your motivations, you, you know, your, the, inspirations that you have and obviously the love and respect that you have for each other and the support that you give each other and um it's been our treat to have your work on exhibit at our museum thank so, you well, thank, thank you, you. Thank so much for having us on tap you see okay. you'll notice the michigan state stuff there so <laughs> <laughs> pretty happy that it's at michigan state <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, have a good evening and thank you again, all of you. Thank you so much for having us. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.